But the weakness in capital growth is its air, right? It's air. Now, the cool thing about buying assets and moving your money out of equity into deposits for other properties is you're basically taking air and using it for something real. So if you have equity floating and you're not using that equity smart enough to run your life, then it is a real waste. It, it can be a real shame. Welcome to the Urban Property Investor. I'm your host, Sam Saggers, here to help you crack the code of real estate wealth. Today's show, we've got a code cracker. We're going to dig into the short-term rental market. We're going to dig into using interceptors like Airbnb to create cash flow in your world. I'm going to give you a little background of what's possible in this space. If you like the idea of becoming a rent entrepreneur, this episode is perfect because this one's for people who like to get hands-on when it comes to real estate investing and not sit back and be passive. You can absolutely change the trajectory of your cash flow using strategies inside the real estate marketplace. I'm going to teach you all about it, give you a little bit of a briefing. So you will leave this episode with some clues as to whether this could be a strategy for you, potentially. It's not a strategy whatsoever. And again, if you're a nervous Nelly when it comes to everything about property, this strategy's probably not the best one. Uh, there's probably simpler strategies uh, like renting a property out long term and sleeping at night. But if you like pushing the boundaries, you like making a bit of money, if you like the idea of cash flow, the idea of using Short-term rental dynamics in the real estate economy is not a bad one, I tell you what, and uh, for a couple of reasons. So uh, I'm going to teach you all about it. If you first, if this is your first time tuning in, welcome to the show. Make sure you leave a review at the end and, of course, play the show in double speed. I do not sound like a chipmunk. I just think it's better to play this stuff in double speed so you can spend some more time educating yourself rather than... Uh, you know, just going slow. And of course, uh, all the lessons on the program or the podcasts are lessons on real estate. So feel free to go back if you like. I'm back in my clothing, uh, as you can see, powered by purple, bleh, powered by purpose, people, place and planet. I'll tell you what, uh, there's a lot of work to be done to help people help the planet and create beautiful places around society. And of course, the idea of Airbnb is all about place economics. It's all about finding an area where people actually want to go and using the place economy uh, to your benefit. So we're going to peer into some data, some future trends, some ideas around real estate so you can uh, walk away thinking, well, you know what? Okay, there's more to this than just, uh, you know, just, you know, going home at night and and not playing the game, the game of Australian monopoly. So I think we can all agree uh, what we do know about real estate is in general, if you choose a good location, you're going to be perfectly great, right? And I think that is a key fundamental of everything we do inside of real estate. It's like the, the golden rule, if you like, location trumps everything. I think uh, we can all agree that Australia's population is headed to bigger and better things. It's going to be a larger population base. I think we all get that. We all know that cities are generally where uh, infrastructure investment is made. And I think it's, uh, it's pretty common for us to realise, well, we are in a world and in particular a place like Australia, which is hot property. People want to come to Australia. People want to migrate to Australia. People lining up around the corner to migrate to Australia. And of course, uh, I obviously, I think it's, it's in general terms fair to say that people do love, if they are a renter, living close to jobs and transport and nice amenity and lifestyle and convenience. I mean, these are all some of the general things we all know about real estate. But 
we are people and we also have ambitions. We have goals, we have dreams, we want outcomes from real estate. And despite the general arity of real estate being a sport of long-term commitments, um, sometimes that needs to mirror up with what retirement actually looks like. And of course, this is where a lot of property investors struggle with property investment. Uh, They have no ability to flip the switch and create extra cash flow. And in retirement, cash flow is what real estate investment is all about. And I think it's fair to say that real estate investments can be split into two subgroups. One is capital growth and one is cash flow. Now, most commentators will teach you about capital growth. I teach you also about capital growth. Capital growth really is quite important, particularly as you're developing or acquiring assets, because it is extremely difficult to save a lot of cash to put into property deals. So quite often, a lot of property investors will multiply their property portfolio by using equity grain gain from capital growth. But as we know, equity is air. And as such, uh, when we reach retirement, that air, unless we decide to sell, is uh, kind of worthless, right? And even if we get to the day of retirement and there's a massive correction in the marketplace, if we just diversify into growth assets, we could actually end up in a very, very dangerous place. So it's very, very good when you're building a portfolio, and I've mentioned this a few times, uh, that it's a smart idea to pick growth assets that you can use also for cash flow purposes. Not all of them, you don't need them all like that, but absolutely, when we divide real estate into two quadrants, being growth and cash flow, it is quite handy to have some assets where you can manipulate the cash flow if you like. Now, I think we all are across my Forex growth plan. It's a great plan. Remember, you buy well, you choose an incredible location, you make sure uh, you're ready to battle in the marketplace and you choose a market that's designed over the long term. And also, you choose some logic around the asset which behaviorally in, uh, makes the asset stand out. Now, these are simple capital growth ideas. They're, they're a formula that works. They work for me. They work for uh, all the assets I've ever b- bought. And you know they certainly work for my clients, right? When there is no capital growth in the market, you can find capital growth potentially from behavioral economics from the fact that your property is architecturally interesting or stands out from the crowd or uh, is at its course something a little bit different to the mainstream market. And as we know, that is extremely, uh, extremely possible in the marketplace despite prices, right? We know we can still find really good deals out there if we look hard enough. Now, I also teach the principle that real estate is really a retirement vehicle. The only reason people buy real estate other than shelter, why people are property investors is to mathematically create a formula of retirement. Now, I teach the five cities, five properties plan. I think five is a good number, particularly off the back of some of the challenges with APRA and responsible lending and just how difficult it is to own, you know, bucket loads of real estate in Australia today, certainly as an individual. So as you guys know, I teach the five properties, five cities plan. All that is, is that we want to acquire five good properties during our period of um, activity of acquisition. So when we're buying growth assets and we're pulling out equity and we're buying more growth assets, we want to do that at least five times. Now, the reason I teach the five city strategy is the idea that you no doubt will come across a marketplace where there's a lot of 
action in the marketplace. Let's say, for example, Melbourne is the hottest market, just hypothetically speaking. It may mean that when you're building your five properties plan, you've got two assets in Melbourne because the year that you're active or whatever it may be, maybe Melbourne's the hottest market to get growth from, right? The point though is you want to end up in a place where you're avoiding land tax. You do not have all your assets trapped in one state and you're also um, getting different market movement at different times. Now, uh, this is generally what happens because though during the coronavirus years of 2020 and 2021, the economy was flooded with stimulus, which basically created an Australia-wide boom, something I had never seen before. Typically, what you get is more territory-based booms occurring. So Sydney might boom, and then Brisbane's really cold, and then Melbourne's booming, and then after that boom, then Brisbane booms, then Adelaide, and you get this kind of almost like dynamic that there's always a couple of places doing faster capital growth rates than others. And so having a portfolio diverse kind of does allow you to catch a bit of growth if markets are moving at different paces. But we can think about it, you know, in all sorts of terms. Like the interesting thing about the five properties, five cities plan is it really is a plan where no matter what happens to you, as long as you acquire the assets, you're going to, without question, just make money from CPI, like from from basically inflation. Um, And if that's the worst you do from real estate, that's fine because it means you're keeping up with the cost of living. Now, rather than talk about the current value of real estate in separate areas around Australia. Um, I'm going to go back five years and I'm going to give you the median value of properties in cities five years ago. So Sydney, the median sort of house price uh, was 870. Wow, 870. It's well over, well over, um, depending on your source, well over like uh, 1.2 million today. Melbourne, 614,000. Today, uh, it is a million dollar territory, the Melbourne marketplace. Uh, Brisbane, five years ago, 489. Today, more like 750, right? Uh, Adelaide, 469. Today, also very much like 750. And Perth, 615, five years ago. Today, actually a little bit less than that, 580. So if you just bought all your assets in Perth, you, you, you would hate life right now, right? That's, that's the reality of it. Right now, Perth's a very good value market. It's very affordable. The metrics around what people earn in that city to the cost of living to the cost of a house price, very in favor of capital growth happening at some point. But uh, I don't know uh, about you, but even having a property in Perth which has not performed, looking at the other four major cities in Australia where there's over a million people, uh, you can see huge amounts of capital growth. Literally, if you just bought the median property value in Sydney, Melbourne, Perth, Brisbane and Adelaide, over the last five years, you would have well and truly made yourself a uh, over a million dollars, over a million dollars, just on the on the median value, right? So the point is, though, you got to get these assets, and um, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, if if they just grow at CPI, um, you know, it, you're talking a lot of capital growth every single year. Think about it, right? If you've got three million dollars worth of assets, um. And, you know, you're, they're performing at sort of, you know, 5% growth or whatever, something, something moderate, you know, you're smashing CPI. So I think we all understand that we've got to get assets into the market. We've got to 
find real estate which is going to become valuable. Um, generally, the more pressure on a marketplace, the more valuable real estate becomes. And we all comprehend that we're on this long-term uh, pathway to financial success. You know, it's going to take 20 years. It's not going to, you're not going to happen overnight. And if you look at the five last five years of the five properties in five cities plan, you've made a million dollars, right? If you did the plan, if you read the book, if you did what the book said when I put it out seven years ago, you're up a million dollars. If you didn't do what the book said, I don't know where you are. You know, maybe you made more because you did something even better. Maybe uh, you haven't made the million dollars. I don't know. I don't know. That That's up to you. I'm just briefing you, right? These are the results that are occurring. These are real factual results. The evidence is in the data. Go back and read, uh, I don't know, what's, what's this book I wrote? The Future of Property Investing in Australia, The Five City Strategy. Look at that. Uh, absolutely. Your total portfolio back in, when did I write this book? I think I wrote this book in like 2016. Um, you know, you're talking uh, 2017 I wrote this book. So five years ago. Yeah, we're absolutely five years ago. Um Go check it out. I'll give you the page number. Go check it out, my friends. And you'll see that if you followed the book five years ago and you acquired the assets, you would be up a considerable amount of money. And so page 84. So again, like, I don't know. Some of this stuff is, is you know, People obviously theorize about it, but absolutely it, it happens. It's happening to other people. It's happening to me. And capital growth is a real thing. But the weakness in capital growth is it's air, right? It's air. Now, the cool thing about buying assets and moving your money out of equity into deposits for other properties is you're basically taking air and using it for something real. So if you have equity floating and you're not using that equity smart enough to run your life, then it is a real waste. It, it can be a real shame. Now, um, you can do all sorts of things to change the trajectory of your cash flow. I mean, I've put out episodes on how I invest. You can do all sorts of things with equity. But uh, as it stands, if you're going to build a really nice portfolio, as I've alluded to in, in some recent episodes, you know, you probably want to include at least one, uh, it doesn't have to be all of them, property that you can use in the gig economy, right? And the gig economy is a great economy. I think the gig economy is amazing. Like the fact that the gig economy is built around unused infrastructure and you can make money out of that just blows my mind. Um, and I think to best explain the gig economy or the shared economy, it's it's the story of the taxi driver, right? For a hundred years, taxis were the dominant form of transport if you needed some rapid transport to get around the place other than public transport. And, you know, 10 years ago, Uber invented an app that just basically smashed the taxi industry. And really, they still haven't recovered. They're certainly fighting back, but the value proposition was better. You got a cleaner car, you got a fresh breath mint, you got a bottle of water, and the car would come to you based on wherever you were. And of course, for taxi drivers, their business model was go to a taxi rank or hang out at the bottom of a hotel, hang out at an airport and hope someone comes along, right? And that pretty much is still the business model other than driving around the streets and hoping someone hails you. So the Uber story is a great story on the idea that disruption happens inside of economics and really, the Uber was the interceptor or major disruptor for the taxi industry. 
But what's so fascinating is that real estate also has disruptors, pieces of technology that can intercept business and bring business to you as a property investor. And again, I think the idea around the conversation around um, the shared economy is a big one, right? There is just so much money to be made. I know people with Amazon stores. Myself, I do some eBaying and make a few bob here or there just for fun, just to test my skills in hobby businesses selling uh, goods on things like eBay. Um, I've got clients who use basically car rental schemes where they rent out cars they 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 make extra income basically car sharing their their cars and their vans and so forth so as a person going through life um you know for many people wage growth is always something that's a, it's a dynamic it's it's not up to them there's many for example government jobs it's very very hard to go and ask for a pay rise um and so a lot of people are returning to the shared economy to make more money and there are some great ways to do it there are you know you can simply even be an uber driver right as as uh you know Obviously, that doesn't sound sexy, but if it's putting money in your back pocket and you've still got another full-time job, so what if it gets you to where you need to go? So for a lot of property investors, uh, they also need extra cash flow. And this is where the idea of understanding that some real estate inside of economics of the real estate market allows you to manipulate its cash flow profile. And really, uh, we get the idea of the growth. I think everyone gets it, right? Just buy a really good property, give it a bit of time and, you know, come back. Growth is there. So what I like to control inside of real estate is cash flow. And so my job as a property investor my job as a property coach is to work out well what type of assets are going to produce some of the best cash flow while maintaining high levels of capital growth and you know i think it's a little bit righteous for a property people to say well you you know you've just got to buy the best property which is a lot of money 1.5 2 million dollars like not everyone can do that and you know, if you could, I would give you the same advice. You know, go and buy the best possible property you can. You're going to make a squillion. But for a lot of people, that's not an option, right? So we have to play in the dirt a bit and try and work our way through this as sensibly as possible. Now, I just put out an episode on Monopoly, the Monopoly board. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Uh, to win Monopoly... You fundamentally, in the end, need hotels. Hotels, typically inside of economics, are the highest yielding asset in the world. In the world. So you take commercial property, you take industrial property, you take residential property, you take uh, retail property, you take the office market. Everything in the entire world of real estate gets smashed by hotels when it comes to yield, when it comes to yield. So to win the game of Monopoly on the Monopoly board, you buy the hotels. To win the game of Australian cash flow, if you could buy hotels, you probably would. But for a lot of people, there is just no way to go and do that. And for a lot of property investors, they don't want to own a motel in a Gopnik village on a motorway, you know, in Timbuktu, right? Who wants that? That sounds like work. That doesn't sound like uh, fun to me. The cool thing is the modern economy allows you to own real estate where you can change the trajectory of the cash flow. So remember, plan A is pretty simple and really for most people, they should stick to plan A. I have many assets doing plan A. Plan A, buy good capital growth property. 
If you can get yourself a really handsome rental return, as the market moves, make sure you activate putting up your rents. We're in a period of time now where that's a really good strategy for people. Just put up those rents, go from negative cash flow if that's where you started to eventually positive cash flow by uh, virtue of time in the market and rents increasing based on market formulas, right? So we all know over time, rents are going to improve. There are periods of uh, rental decreases inside of real estate. There are periods of rental increases in real estate. Generally, the more uh, time you're in the market, the more you're going to get um, a rental performance plan for yourself, right? And I think, um, you know, as uh, Australia sits at the moment, most marketplaces have a vacancy rate less than 2%. And of course, this means most landlords are in charge at the moment when it comes to the rental market as opposed to tenants. Certainly two years ago, a lot of the tenants were in charge with all the kerfuffle with COVID. Uh, that's gone full circle. And, and right now, we're really in a bit of a rental crisis, to be honest with you inside of the country. I don't think there's enough real estate going around, particularly with borders reopening. So plan A we get. What about plan B, the rent entrepreneur plan? How do we activate the rent entrepreneur plan? So firstly, I think we need to understand that real estate allows us to change the trajectory of its cash flow. If we buy in the right location, the right place, there's going to be appeal there beyond capital growth and beyond long-term rents. What's the next level of appeal? Well, it is generally the fact that people view the neighborhood where that asset is as a neighborhood that they would like to visit. Whether they're a business person, whether they're a holiday maker, whether they're connected to some sort of stay in any way, shape or form, if you have real estate in places, you tend to be able to play the capital growth game, the cash flow game of long-term rents and the cash flow game of short-term rents. Now, let me go back a step. When I say places... When you think about cities, there aren't many places where people actually want to visit. You think about Sydney, you know, it's 300 suburbs. Do people want to visit all 300 suburbs? Well, the short answer is no. Do people want to visit Bondi? Absolutely, they do. Uh, do people want to visit Surrey Hills? Absolutely, they do. Do people want to visit the CBD? Absolutely, they do. And when you think about a great city like Melbourne, Melbourne is arguably kind of very New York-y. It's got a lot of cool laneways. It's got a very good dining culture. It's got a very good arts culture. It's got a lot of events, a lot of entertainment. When people travel to Melbourne, not everyone wants to sit in the CBD like Times Square is to New York. People want to go to Soho. People want to go to... Uh, the Meat Packers district. People want to go to Tribeca as they do in New York. People want to go to Pran. They want to go to Collingwood and Fitzroy. That's that's the charm of going to the city. And of course, when we think about the idea of building a portfolio, we have choices. And when it comes to the choice of adding a property which is going to get high growth, but also appeal to the long-term market and the short-term market, I tend to do this strategy inside of cities. And the reason being, if for whatever reason the market was to shut down and uh, I was caught, I could always refer back to having two fundamentals. One, I mean, a great growth location too. I can always go back to long-term renting my properties. Now, Warren Buffett has that famous sort of quote, never buy an asset unless you're prepared for the market to shut down for 10 years plus. So Airbnb, if you like, or short-term rental 
is available all around the country, but in New South Wales, uh, some legislation of recent times has made it more difficult to do. And of course, there is some legislation you can read on that, that you can rent your property out six months a year. Um, Short term, um, you know, you can't do it 12 months a year. Uh, However, you can take bookings of over like 21 days and that's not considered short term. There's a whole bunch of rules around it. I am not going to explain those rules. You can go and look them up. Uh, Around other cities, as of yet, there is no management of the shared economy like that. But again, um, I don't like the idea of having, you know, a farmhouse in, you know, uh, a little village, which is, you know, I don't know, a strange place at best of time. And then all of a sudden government shutting down the idea of uh, holiday rentals, right? So, uh That is a caveat to this strategy. We want to do this strategy, but we want to identify places where if we can rent the property out six months a year, it outperforms outperforms our 12-month lease. Uh, However, if the world ends tomorrow, we want to know that we're in a good place, right? So for me, I use this strategy in robust suburbs of our major cities simply because uh, my defensive strategy with that is to not trust anything when it comes to government inside of real estate. So, of course, you can go out to some regional communities, buy yourself a farmhouse, um, put, I don't know, 20, you know, dwellings on on the land and try and get yourself a massive cash cow underway. And all power to you if you're prepared to do that. I do have some clients thinking about doing this kind of stuff at the moment. And, uh, you know, they're determined to do it. And and I think they will be successful. I know one lady who's doing some stuff with caravans, another lady doing stuff with like teepees and stuff like that. And again, um, you know, the idea of the shared economy is just, the, the gig economy, right? It's it's spare inventory. If you've got a, bl- a parcel of farmland in a very trendy, you know, weekender marketplace, you're going to do great. You're going to do great. Um, you can do some stuff with that, right? However, uh, if your assets are in Gopnik suburbs and Gopnik villages that no one really wants to go to and you really just you know, stop there for a meat pie and leave, or, you know, you like, you just simply drive through the very dormitory places like Airbnb and short terms, not, not going to work. So I think I'm clear around that. How I do this is I just pick really popular suburbs in mainstream places so that my defensive strategy is if the market was to shut down, I just go back to long term. And Let's face it, the last two years has seen the market, this strategy shut down. I've not been talking about this strategy throughout my podcast series because the market has been shut down. And of course, for most people, um, you know, doing that strategy while the Australian borders were shut was was a little bit volatile, right? So you want to be a pandemic proof kind of real estate investor. Let's face it, you do want to be a pandemic proof real estate investor. For for me, uh, when coronavirus hit, borders were shut, people couldn't move. Um, I just flicked the switch and and uh, stopped uh, my short term rents and and made them long term in the suburbs where um, th- my strategy is active. And again, like, you know, I wouldn't know the difference. Like other than missing two weeks rent while I switched it over, it was like nothing happened. So that's what I think is the smartest approach because my approach is defense first approach. However, obviously I get it. You can buy a church, refit it out as some sort of a magical airbnb place and you know rent it out for a fortune on a highway between you know hobart and launceston knock yourself out if that's you make it happen um 
I tell you what, when it comes to the idea of short stay, you can be several different types of rent entrepreneur, an entrepreneur of rent. Now, uh, one of my, I guess I would say favorite girlfriends, I'm, I'm now married, so I probably shouldn't say that, but one of my favorite girlfriends, uh, and, you know, we should have, we should have, um, you know, hung out uh, longer when when we were together, but we were always apart. Like she was living in another state, and I was living in a, um, you know, another place, and it never worked out. But she was just a really nice human being. She is the ultimate rent entrepreneur. She honestly blows my mind how successful she has been with this strategy, and she kicks my ass when it comes to being a rent entrepreneur. Probably because um, she focuses on it and I don't necessarily have time to just focus on being a rent entrepreneur. But to explain it, uh, she actually bought uh, five properties that she could rent each one of them on things like Airbnb, right? And so she turned all five properties in good growth locations into properties which can get a short-term uh, result from the real estate marketplace. And at the time, she was earning like $75,000 a year flying around as a flight attendant in aeroplanes. And to get out of that job, and of course, a lot of flight attendants go through this, it's like the older you get, you're like, well, you know, is there something else I can do with my life? Like, the end of the day, um, it is a pretty grueling profession, aviation. So she used her wage to acquire five incredibly good assets. And all five were in great growth spaces. They still are in great growth areas. And she sw flipped the switch. She put them all onto short stay. Now, her rent of those assets basically doubled. As you know, if you're going to run properties in a short-term capacity, you're going to have to factor in cleaning. You're going to have to factor in, um, you know, changing bedding. You're going to have to factor in, you know, advertising the property. And, of course, today there are what we refer to as short-stay property managers. There's some great companies out there that basically manage all of that for you. They'll make sure that, the guest gets the keys. They'll make sure that, you know, the property is represented as a very nice place to stay. They'll put little bars of soap in the shower, uh, you know, the shower and, and shampoo and, you know, they'll put little candles in there and little guest booklets so guests have something to do, right? So she was working 75 grand a year, um, flighty, sick of it. Um, she took five years knowing what she wanted in life to acquire five good assets, flip the switch. She uh, ended up turning those assets into over $150,000 in cash flow coming in. Um, now, of course, she's got mortgages, so that sucks out a bit of it. But the interesting thing was that she was able to leave her job and basically then go into being what we would refer to as a full-time rent entrepreneur. So she was running the cleaning. She was running the um, uh, running the cleaning. She was running the uh, you know bookings. Um, she was doing everything by herself, and as such, learned just so much about the idea of you know being a rent entrepreneur. She was able to replace her job and she became fundamentally a hotelier of her own assets. And today she is still doing that. And guess what? Like every good startup business story, she now runs not only her own assets, but other people pay her to run their assets who are more time poor when it comes to this type of thing. So again, like the idea of the gig economy is to be smart about this stuff. You can replace your income if you're smart 
and you can do it faster if you want to apply yourself and actually take bigger and more bold uh, got risks and goals to go for it, right? So uh, when it comes to being a short-term rental person, uh, a rent entrepreneur, I kind of divide it into a few sections. First section is you, if you do have your family home and your family home is in a good location that people want to go to, uh, absolutely, you can rent it out a couple of times a year and really swap your premises for a holiday. I personally have not paid for a holiday in forever. And I take some big, big holidays. The reason I take uh, some awesome holidays is I'm not paying for them out of my wage. I'm activating them through really uh, using my home and getting a short-term result four weeks a year max uh, from the idea of the shared economy. And again, there's some pros and cons to that, but absolutely a lot of people I know do that form of being a rent entrepreneur. And when you think about it, that's a bit of a game changer as well. As simple as that sounds for many, many people, just getting you know a couple of weeks a year worth of uh, worth of high income rent, you know, and and for some houses it's like thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars over over four weeks. It's a huge amount of money, right? It's a huge amount of money, and so uh, for a lot of people, that is what is going on. They are taking a very good asset and they're getting turbocharged rents over a four week period and clearing out of their own home. So there's obviously a few tax implications all around that. I won't get into all of that, but at the end of the day, cash flow is king. And for many people, they're not planning on selling their assets, so they are absolutely tacking into the idea of smashing some cash flow from spare inventory. They want to go on holidays, they do a bit of a swap. And I think when you look around some of the particularly holiday places uh, around Australia, you find a lot of this swapping going on where, yeah, like at the end of the day, it's really a full-time rental property except for four weeks a year, right? Or a full-time family-owned property except for four weeks a year. So that's kind of the the, the first thing that you, you kind of get into this kind of marketplace. Obviously, the, the second version of that, if you like, is, you know, people doing rent to rent or renting spare rooms. And of course, one of the problems with Airbnb, you know, quite often you see the rental market actually capitalizing doing a rent to rent. What's a rent to rent? A rent to rent is when a renter rents to another renter. And uh, quite often you see rent to rent inside the Airbnb marketplace. And of course, this is this kind of like, um, you know, couch surfing kind of a commodity, if you like, people basically going, you know what, I need to go to Melbourne. Uh, I just need a bed. You know, who can I who who can I share a house with or an apartment with for three nights, right? And someone's living there. They're doing a rent to rent. They're covering their long term rent, so they're paying you four hundred dollars a week. And they're renting a room out three nights a week to a traveler who's paying them $600. They then pay you $400 whilst your property is being used as a rent to rent, right? That's the the other thing that is unfolding. And of course, property managers try and protect this as best as possible by putting things in leases and making sure that they kind of police it. But... The other version is rather than your renter actually capitalizing on this uh, awesome amount of cash flow you can create, you can be like my uh, flight attendant friend, you can be a rent entrepreneur. Now, the only caveat or difference is most people I know don't want to do the bookings, don't want to do the check-ins, don't want to do the clean. My friend, happy to do that, replaced her income doing that. And really that role, if you like, is very much like being a flight attendant, you know, checking people in, 
cleaning things. Um, it's, it's very hospitality based. And so when it comes to the next form of Airbnb being, if you like, or short-term renting, it's just the idea that uh, if you have a property in the right place, you can get exceptional rents and you can use a short-term property manager to run it or for you today in Australian economics. So a long-term rent property manager is typically like, um, you know, you've got brand names out there, R&W, Ray White, um, LJ Hooker, they do sort of long-term leasing. And then you've got some really niche short-term business models that basically run your bookings. They do dynamic bookings, which are things like, you know, monitoring the price of a, of, of a room every day. Um, you know, they have key inventory systems. They have systems to run your property very much like a hotelier would run properties. Now, again, like at the end of the day, now Australia's borders are open. We're probably going to see guest bookings return to a pre-COVID normal. A pre-COVID normal was, was typically you had 50% of bookings within short-term rentals as interstate uh, movement and 50% as international. There is an argument in the sector that a lot of people do not want to go to hotels because if there was to be a lockdown, which there won't be, that you know they want a bit more space today for their stay in an area. And so we are seeing actually some early data that the Australian tourism market off the back of short stay is skyrocketing. Like there is a lot of cash flow happening and a lot of people choosing Airbnbs over hotels at the moment, particularly local people. So short stay, what it is not, it is not buying a hotel room and getting a serviced apartment rent or being part of a service apartment motel pool. Now, in real estate, you'll see these schemes a lot. There's a lot of them like in Port Douglas and stuff like that. It's like, you know, buy this room and get a 6% return. Do never do that. Never ever do that as long as you live. Banks don't like that stuff. That is not liquidable real estate. No one wants to own or occupy one day a hotel room. So please never do that. This When we're talking about short stay, that is not what we're talking about. What we are talking about is getting a really good property which is designed for capital growth, is designed for home owners to live in it and actually turning it into a short-term rental property because the property is in a very, very good suburb. It's as simple as that, right? And today there is massive arguments in this space. There's not enough rental properties in the marketplace for the long-term market. Um, and so, you know, adding Airbnbs in there or short-term stays, you know, just compounds the issue, right? And today, you know, there's school teachers living in their cars because there's nowhere to live, right? And so I follow one dude on TikTok. He's a full-on school teacher. He lives in his car. He's got nowhere to live. Uh, can't keep up with the cost of living. And there are no rental properties anyway. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, like this is, this is one of the major reasons we want defense first. Good suburb, good location, good prospect of long-term tenancy, and then we flip the switch to short term. We change the trajectory of the cash flow, right? So um, simply what that means is daily rental arbitrage. Daily rental arbitrage. So let's say a property makes $500 a week as a normal rental property, but it can make $200 a night as a short term rental property. All of a sudden, the $500 a week doesn't look as attractive as the $1,400 a week, $200 a night times seven, $1,400. Of course, you have to then apply the occupancy rate. And generally speaking, uh, you know, occupancy can be anywhere from 60 to 80%. So let's go with 80% just by virtue of uh, easy maths. So, you know, 
five hundred dollars a week long term, fourteen hundred dollars a week full time, being two hundred dollars a night short term. Eighty percent of that, um, I don't know the mass. Let's call it you know eleven twelve hundred dollars a week. All of a sudden, you're doubling your income, and so for a lot of people, this is highly attractive because. Obviously, very much like the shared economy, why go and drive an Uber as a second job when you can extract more out of being a property investor? So you obviously got to choose a property if you're going to do this in an urban location that is designed around something interesting, a place. And you quite often hear in Sydney, where I come from, a lot of the short-term rentals, if you like, are down in Bondi. Bondi is a place. It's the place to go. It's the place to be. There's young, uh, you know, highly paid workforce in the neighborhood there. It is a glamour suburb. People want to be part of the suburb. As a traveler, there is a lot of people to meet. There are people to hang out with. There is things to see. There is beautiful amenity. There's a lovely beach. Um, And again, like the people doing Airbnb inside of Bondi are making a fortune despite the law changes. Like they are getting um, some highly, highly valuable rents. I've got some friends doing it down there at the moment and they just smash it. They smash it. And the other interesting thing is the society there expects it and wants it. It likes the almost like um, fun nature of, of the idea that more travelers, there's more action, there's more nightlife, there's more things on, right? And again, um, when it comes to the idea of doing this in an urban area, you kind of want uh, action and you want, you know, a great walkable suburb, great retail. You want uh, the ability to be close to CBD, sporting events, conventions, These are the things your customer is analyzing. And of course, your customer is a traveler. When you travel somewhere, you want something to do. Now, again, like I'm a business Bedouin. And since border lockdowns are, uh, you know, not happening at the moment and hopefully never will happen again, um, I've gone back to business travel. I've already got business things lined up, which I just simply can't do from an office or even from Zoom, right? I've got to go and see things. I've got to go do things, meet people, have critical conversations. And as a business uh, better one, as a traveler, I can assure you when I choose a place to go, I'm looking for something I can walk to at nighttime to do something fun and be a part of community. I do not want to go to a sleepy little place in the middle of nowhere, right? That just doesn't make sense. And quite often as a business person, you travel by yourself. So again, the last thing you want is to be uh, in an area which has no energy, right? So again, the purpose of this stuff is to um, you know, choose an asset in an energy-rich suburb, a suburb with lots of culture where that culture is manifested, right? Remember the three principles of real estate, you know, shelter, culture, and a storage of wealth. We want this culture piece to get the results. Now, of course, if you're going to do this, you're going to have to buy things like furniture. And furniture doesn't come cheap, right? And again, like you want really durable furniture to put into your properties, you're going to do this in. And remember, you know, Really, the idea of selling your property through things like Airbnb or short-stay providers is its kind of making your property stand out from the crowd. And I see a lot of people fail as rent entrepreneurs because they just basically are providing a service department look and feel to a property. Uh, My properties, you know, I put bikes on the wall. I, like, have games in the cupboards. I've got... Um, you know, pretty funky impressions to attract people on a digital connectivity, right? Remember, you're selling the digital impression to begin with if you're going to do this strategy. Even with short-term rental providers, always like say like, I think we should do something a little bit more funkier 
to make us stand out from the crowd? What's wrong with providing a $100 bike to your property that you're offering? And of course, if someone wants to use that, they're going to give you a better re- ranking and a better referral. So remember, furnishing matters, as does photography. That is an absolute must. You do not have to be an expert. There are interior designers. You can uh, pay and employ and they'll provide all of this stuff for you. But I will say, you know, go the extra mile in that space if you are going to do it. And again, there are property managers that handle things like understanding your competition, understanding your pricing, running dynamic pricing, um, understanding when there is massive local events that just skyrocket the rents, right? You won't know that. Um, You know, you're not potentially even from this neighborhood, right? And you think about it like, you know, Adelaide has the Fringe Festival, right? And the properties that are close to the Fringe Festival, the, 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 the month that the festival's on, you know, the rents are just ridiculous, right? Ridiculous. And again, this is the idea. We want to be in these super interesting places if we're going to do this in our cities, um, mainly because you've constantly got this idea of people coming. People travel to cities a lot. You know, even between Sydney and Melbourne, you know, prior to coronavirus, there was a flight every 15 minutes, like catching a bus. So many business people would go to Melbourne, so many Melbourne people would come to Sydney. And it looks very much like it's going to go back into a solid place like that. Maybe it'll take a little bit longer to get back to what it was. But let's face it, more people are coming to Australia. Australia is going to continue to be a highlighted place. Now, of course, you're going to need insurance. Um, You know, there are insurers that specialize in things like short stay. And, you know, you're going to have to factor in that from the return you get, you know, you're going to have to pay for an Airbnb manager and cleaning costs and a few other dynamics like that, right? It's just the way it works. Now, in Sydney, if you were to go and get a hotel, um, for the night, you're probably going to uh, now sort of pay anywhere from sort of 250 to $300 a night for a decent hotel. That's maybe even more, right? Maybe even more. Melbourne, fairly similar. Brisbane, fairly similar. Uh, and on the weekends, you know, during the weekday, you're going to pay sort of 250 But during the weekends, you you know, it can, it can skyrocket, right? And so... This is where your asset as an Airbnb comes into play. And again, like you will find that where this is popular is where there is also hotels. So you are also competing with the hotel marketplace, right? Um, sometimes like obviously, you know, tranquil little, you know, tree change places in the middle of nowhere where you want to go and sit by a fire and drink wine and not, not be bothered by the world, like very, very different. And again, that's not what I'm talking about today and all power to that kind of real estate if that real estate is something you can manifest and and look after. I'm sure it'll do well. Uh, What I'm talking about is just defensive strategy. Let's buy a really good location to begin with, make sure it's got a really good long-term rent then change the trajectory of our cash flow. Do that in places like Bondi, Paran, Collingwood, Fitzroy, New Farm. These are these are neighborhoods which you apply this logic to, right? Now again, like uh, you know, if you look at short-term rental returns in say Sydney, uh, you can get a thousand to twelve hundred dollars a week for a one-bedroom apartment on an eighty percent occupancy. Right, so it's not even occupied twenty percent of the time. You're still pulling a thousand bucks. You know, two bedroom apartment in Melbourne can get up to the same, right? A thousand bucks a week, Um, and three bedrooms. Obviously, families, you know, who are traveling don't want to rent three hotel rooms. So for them, two and three bedroom apartments are great, right? They can, they can. you know, provide some some critical infrastructure to travelers, traveling families. And they'll pay, you know, fifteen hundred to two and a half thousand dollars a week, right? So 
there's a lot of cash flow to be made out in the marketplace. And generally what I uh, have seen, certainly pre-COVID, was one bedrooms earning anywhere up to $45,000 after your management fees and cleaning costs, uh, two bedrooms earning around $60,000 after your um, cleaning costs and management fees and three bedrooms earning around $80,000 per annum after your cleaning costs and management fees. Certainly happened to me. Um, I I was running a smashing property in Brisbane. Uh, I was getting $75,000 net on that asset. It was I was doing so well. Um, and I, I sadly had to sell that property and it's a, it's a story for another day. Um, but it was just earning off its head, earning, it was earning so much money. Um, and I, I actually, uh, had to sell that asset, um, because of a challenge, um, inside of my uh, own economics that year. So I needed to take the capital growth out of the deal and put it into a business I started up. And I tell you what, uh, I wish I didn't because the business I started up has not performed as well as that property. Um, but I had also made a lot of capital growth out of that asset. So at the time, I was like, ah, oh, I've got to gotta sell something to raise some money to put into a business I was starting. And uh, that was the property I ended up moving. And whew, again, 75 Gs. Uh, man, there was a lot of cash flow. So my portfolio is structured this way to to flick the switch. Um, and, you know, there's probably two more properties I'd need to go and flick the switch on. Uh, to be honest, I'm always so busy. I always like, um, you know, forget to go and do it. And then like COVID hit. And so, but now uh, I'm going to flick the switch. So this year is my switch flicking year for two assets, which I'm going to, uh, double their income uh, now that travel is back, right? And again, I went into defensive mode on two of my properties. Um, now I'm going back into offensive. Actually, there's probably three, really, I should do it on. Anyway, um, I'm rambling now. Um, so uh, remember, there is, when I say Airbnb, I'm just talking about platforms, right? Like there's bookings.com, stays.com, Expedia, Home and Away, uh, Priceline.com, Airbnb, these are all just, you know, numbers, right? They're all just numbers. Uh, sorry, platforms, interceptors. So again, your short-term rental manager will do that. But I think it's fair to say to be successful in an urban world, you want to understand that your property is connected to culture, uh, a nightlife culture, a weekend culture, a business culture, a tourism culture, an events culture, a sporting culture, and even a hospital culture. And if you've got that around your property, you can absolutely kick some ass for when you do uh, things like short-term rentals. All right, guys, I hope uh, this plan can help you and uh, you decide to build a portfolio as I say, you just need one property like this. You don't even need four of them. Like think about my two-bedroom apartment was a, was earning $75,000 a year until I had a dumb idea to sell it, right? $75,000 per annum. The normal rent on that property was like $33,000 per annum. And again, you just need one of them, right? And you've replaced your income. Remember my uh, old chum, my flight, flight attendant, um, ex-girlfriend, smashes it, freaking smashes it. And uh, she went full-time on this. I've never gone full-time because I obviously have a job sharing information and doing some other things, but uh, I've not I've not stopped my day job to go and do being a rent entrepreneur full-time. But people have, and you can too, but you've got to uh, marry the right assets to, to do this, right? It's all about asset allocation. All right. Well, thanks for tuning in. I'll catch you next time on the Urban Property Investor. Thanks for tuning in to the Urban Property Investor. To never miss an episode, make sure you subscribe to the podcast on your favorite app or on YouTube. And I would love it if you could give the show a rating and share it with your friends and family. In between episodes, you can always keep in touch with me by connecting on social media over Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. 
Until we meet again on the next episode with the Urban Property Investor, take care and bye for now.